Hey there, here we are with a long overdue update on the Cantal Kilt project. Now, the Cant this was uh, to recap a uh, group of reenactors down in the States wanted some kilts made to the wartime, the Great War wartime standard for one of the battalions, at least one of the battalions of the Canadian Black Watch in World War I, because they, the battalion was raised for wartime service. They couldn't get government tartan. They weren't prepared to ship it across the, the ocean. So they resorted to having kilts made in the regimental tweed of the Black Watch. Um, there are two examples, two surviving examples that we're aware of, and they're both in a museum in Quebec. So I, have, I was working with pictures of these things. And when looking at the pictures, and I don't know how I can, eventually I'll have the editing skills to insert the pictures, but we, looking at the photos, I was basically doing sort of, I won't say best guess, but in, an informed guess after nearly 50 years of working with army kilts. Uh, the originals were clearly not made of eight yards of cloth, barely seven and a half, because we, we were seeing the things that we typically see in army issue kilts made over the last hundred years, particularly during wartime, in that the ends of the aprons were the minimal amount of cloth possible. Like the, the the turnover was sometimes less than two inches, very narrow. That also that the apron pleats, there'd be a minimal apron, apron pleat on the left hip, tops the width of your palm, three, four inches. Almost invariably, no apron pleat on the right hip, just cloth running out from the last, uh, from the last of the pleats. In the original kilts, the surviving kilts, um, they were less than 31 pleats. They were, um, the red lines were misaligned. They were all over to one edge. Now I can't say how much of that was a result of wartime manufacturing, because clearly they're, they're made by someone who had a, who was clearly told what to do, possibly had never made a kilt before, but did a damn good effort. But the, in the existing kilts, the red lines aren't centered. They're way off to one side. They're almost at the crease. And that's, they were possibly made that way, but they were possibly also re-sewed that way after, they, after, after some period of service and the stitches came apart. Um, the, fortunately, they, they had one buckle on either side. Fortunately, they didn't, they didn't have a, a lower buckle on the hip, which surprised me a bit because generally kilts of that age, military kilts of that age, two on the right, none on the left. So... This has taken as long as it has because, well, this happened, you know, we were doing this during the pandemic when my uh, associate and I couldn't get together. But we were also spent a lot of time just sort of staring at it going, what way do we go forward? Because as I've showed earlier, the edge, the, the, the selvage edge wasn't a kilting selvage at all. It was, it was quite thin. I mean, this isn't very tightly woven cloth. This is loosely woven cloth. And the selvage edges were ridiculously loose. You could literally put your finger through them. So we decided at the beginning, we can't have that, uh, that lower selvage on the kilt because it's gonna snag on the first thing that it hits and just tear it, right? So we hand stitched, we folded up, what's that, about half an inch, three eighths of an inch. And um, we, we hand stitched it for eight yards. So that took a bit of time. Then we were kind of concerned about the bulk of the thing, right? Because now you've got double the width of cloth at the fringe, or sorry, at the, at the, the bottom edge of the selvage. Um, we also, where also we had departed from the original was uh, kilts at that time had very, very narrow seam allowances cut in the back and, and within Less, less than half an inch, three eighths tops. And the problem with tweed, of course, is tweed unravels like anything. And so I decided at that point, I'm not gonna make such a narrow uh, seam allowance because it's simply gonna pull apart. And also to help counteract that, instead of one narrow bit of um, canvas from buckle to buckle, not extending the whole piece, instead of a narrow piece of canvas, which wasn't, in my opinion, or see, the ones I've seen in the past, not adequately sewn to the tartan, We've gone from my, I won't say my patent, but my uh, my standard, which is five inches wide, continuous piece from buckle to strap, folded over at the ends to give more stiffness, more rigidity. 
Now we didn't because these kilts are done to the army standard in which um, the buckle and strap are at the natural waist and then three inches is added as, as a rise. So we've gone for that. I didn't want to go for that, but it was pointed out to me that when they're wearing these things under service dress tunics, and wearing the pattern 1908 webbing, if the kilt isn't high enough, the bottom, or sorry, the top edge, sorry, yeah, if the kilt isn't high enough and they're wearing the webbing, if they move their bodies at all, the, the kilt is going to slip out from underneath the belt. And it, it may not be visible when wearing the coat, but it's going to feel awful. So we did go for the high rise. I didn't use a wider piece of canvas because the, of course, the body, the torso gets wider above the natural waist. So I've left the top so that it can expand to fit that added dimension, which I didn't have. I wasn't, I wasn't given. So we have um, proper, you know, modern standards, my modern standards of canvas, my modern standards of a deep apron and a deep overlap. Because you'll notice I've left a few bases in here. On top of everything else, chalk wouldn't show on this, on this tweed. We'd use clay chalk and it was invisible within minutes. I tried using wax chalk and it was no better. So basically every point in this kilt where, and the next kilt, where we would have to, where we would chalk, we had to use a base of white thread instead. And I've left a few of those in place. Um, I've also departed from the original in that the top, they had a top band, which wasn't the standard army green. Let's call it grassy green. Um, because obviously they didn't have a supply. It was a different color, so um, the closer I did to, is I have this um, this woven grainy woolen tape, which is quite a bit wider than the original, and I considered that necessary because the original stuff's only like five eighths, uh, and given the extra thickness of the kilt, I, I elected to go with a wider cloth tape so we could adequately cover the ends. So. On the plus side also, I'm using original World War I kilt buckles, of which I have a small supply. These are, I'm getting near the end of these things. The next stage is I'm going to be putting in the lining, and I was able to get the original lining, new made, not, not heritage cloth. But I managed to get the original lining cloth from a historical textiles supplier. So this is the, the wool um, flannel which exactly matches the original stuff. Well, not quite exactly because it's new and therefore it's white or whitish ivory, let's say, versus the originals that we've always seen, which after um, decades of wear, uh, sometimes are a rather displeasing urine yellow color, not, not a good color. So yeah, so I'm going to have these in probably within the day and it should be ready to ship... Uh, within a day or two and then I'll get on to the next one because this is this has been sort of the beta test one and again I apologize it's taken so long but literally it'd be a matter of nope I can't figure it out I'm going to get on to some other work and see if I an idea comes to me so so there we are we've uh we've we're just about complete this one we'll have it into you there's